I'd like to thank Elliot and the whole team at Amazon for making it possible for me to speak today. I'm a big fan of the Amazon services. They've basically made all of the hard work I have to do in the data center something where I'm just pressing <coughs> buttons on a computer. Very happy about that. Um, so I'm going to represent my um, company, Citro, which is a very recent startup founded by Daphne Collar, who's a very well-respected uh, machine learning researcher who also founded Coursera. So if you've ever taken Coursera courses, you know, you should, you know, pay attention to our company too. Uh, and I'm going to talk about rethinking drug discovery using machine learning. Uh, my background is actually in drug discovery, but it was very oriented around physical simulations on supercomputers, and this is going to be a very big change. Um, uh -oh. Ah, oh, I see. Oh, that's crappy. Um, this slide came from somebody else who, who did a little bit of a, um, animation. Uh, so we're creating a new paradigm for drug uh, discovery and drug development, um, and it uses high quality data. And by high quality data, I'll explain a little bit more, but it means very high resolution um, images from microscopes, from um, other devices, um, where in the past, most of that work has been very low quality data. I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. Uh, data driven models, so hun um, training models from hundreds of terabytes of data. This actually is very similar to other talks we've seen earlier today, um, and so it's encouraging to see that these kinds of platforms are, are becoming more and more popular. Um, and the goal is to design novel, safe, effective therapeutics. Uh, one of the big problems with drugs that get discovered today is they have bad side effects. Viox, which was a painkiller um, that was going to be the next wonder drug, um, came out, and when it got released, it turns out it was killing all these people due to stomach bleeding, all that kind of stuff. It turned out that when they ran the clinical trials, they misinterpreted the results, and it caused um, large numbers of people to die, and then the drug was taken off the market. It is effective for a lot of people, and they could have actually had a genotype test that would have allowed it to be um, remain on the market. And the goal here is to help more people faster and for lower cost. You may have heard some modern cancer drugs cost $250,000 for nine months treatment, and then you know the the end, the end state is death, unfortunately. Um, and so we really want to use machine learning to help reduce those kinds of high costs and low effect, uh, effectiveness in, in populations. Uh, so you can think of drug discovery as a large state space exploration, um, just like AlphaGo or a chess. We have to explore an enormous number of combinatorial possibilities, evaluate most of them. Um, and then throw away the vast majority of them. And so being able to sample those spaces is really hard, um, but some of the questions that you really want to ask are, uh, for example, what is the target that's causal for this disease? If there's a disease, heart disease or cancer, what is the protein that's causing the problem in the person's body? And how do we then find a lead, which is a small molecule that perturbs that target so that it no longer has the abnormal function? Um, once you have a lead, you want to optimize it to increase its efficacy and reduce the side effects. Um, and then finally, um, you want to find genotypes in patients that explain the response to those drugs so that you can find the right drug for the right patient. Uh, so a little bit of, a, of an excursion here. You probably are familiar with Moore's Law that says the amount of um, circuits that you can put in a constant area is doubling every 18 months. That stopped being true a few years ago, which is why computers aren't really getting faster in the way that they used to. Um, pharma has an opposite rule. This is Moore's Law backwards, Eroom's e -rooms Law, it's kind of silly. But basically it says that the number of drugs you get per constant spend is decreasing, and that is not a good sign. This, um, every year, Fewer and fewer drugs come out, they're more and more expensive, and um, that's not progress. Um, so why do these failures occur? Um, and, or, or rather, why are drugs so expensive? And it's because there are so many failures. Um, so basically, if you start out at the top of that state-space exploration, you find many potential leads, but then you put them through increasingly stringent tests, and more and more of them fall out. If you can reduce the failure rate, your cost goes down. Um, now, a little bit of a change. Um, I spent 10 years working at Google before this, uh, and I worked on machine learning systems. Not, I wasn't a data scientist. I wasn't a machine learning engineer. I was a, a large-scale systems performance person. And what I did was I worked on systems for ads in YouTube that you've seen every day, like Watch Next. If you've ever used Watch Next in YouTube, it shows you a whole bunch of videos. Those videos are picked by a machine learning algorithm based on what you have watched previously, what <coughs> other people like you have watched previously, and um, by basically treating it as a ranking problem that we machine learn, 
we can figure out what are the most likely videos. It's actually kind of scary watching my kids use it because it comes up with videos and they just sit there endlessly clicking on the top one or letting it flow through. Um, so click-through rate in ads is another example. This is why Google makes so much money. Basically they say when, when we show you ads, we want to make sure that the probability you click on them is as high as possible. So we use um, machine learning to basically find what are the features about your query and what are the ads that would give you the ads that you're most likely to click on. Um, this typically works by taking enormous amounts of web logs, hundreds of terabytes, and then training fairly simple models. In fact, some of the most successful models at Google are linear and logistic regression without deep networks. That's changing. I can't really say too much about that, but you know, it turns out that logistic and linear regression on 100 terabytes of data works, and it works really well. Uh, for things where the responses are, are mostly linear, and in fact, it works surprisingly well for nonlinear problems as well. Um, so, a lot of ML is hype. You know, I read this site called Hacker News. Sorry, I shouldn't keep moving away from the, the um, mic. I read this site called Hacker News, and every week there's a new paper coming out saying that they've solved some crazy problem. They call it a neural Turing machine architecture. You go read the paper, it's like, uh, yeah, I guess that's cool. Um, but the reality is that there's only a few things in ML that have been repeatedly shown to work well. Uh, if you're working with image data, if you want to do image recognition, convolutional neural networks win every time. A network like Inception v3 um, is unbelievably powerful. And in fact, this, the, the improvement over the past 10 years has been absurd. Um, if you have sequence data, sequence can be a large number of things, including genomic sequences, but also time series data. Uh, LSTMs, long short-term memory, um, uh, recurrent neural networks, they're really good at memorizing sequences and their statistical properties. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Um, is the newest of the kind of ML techniques that has become really popular, but it actually turns out to be extremely well um, uh, designed to approach drug discovery problems. Um, so we've already actually seen great examples of this uh, where um, the progress in ML for, uh, for example, digital pathology, looking for cancer or other, you know, this is a cancer example. Um, Seven years ago, they were roughly comparable to a pathologist, um, you know, to an OK one. Um, they started getting, um, you know, basically expert level performance, and then finally, in the past year or so, have exceeded a car oh, to some metrics, not to every metric, the performance of an actual pathologist. And so this is amazing because pathologists are very highly paid uh, people who, if you can suddenly replace that with an algorithm that runs in the cloud, it changes the cost function of treating people and identifying, um, you know, what is their disease and how to properly treat them. Um, so the, the improvements here are, are really legitimate, and I think that they're going to transform how pathology is done in the next decade. Uh, so why can't we take those ideas and exploit them for uh, drug discovery? And if we start doing that, we can do things like explore larger spaces. I said drug discovery is a large state space exploration. The goal is to sample smaller amounts of that space and be able to create generalizable models that predict things outside of their training zone. Um, applying transfer learning. So I mentioned Inception v3. Um, just before I left, I worked on a project to help teach um, kids robots to recognize different objects. So there are competitions where the robots drive around and then they're normally driven by human beings who see, oh, there's a wiffle ball or, an, or a tennis ball. I need to pick that up and move this into the box. I was able to take TensorFlow object detection framework um, and retrain it from what it was previously trained to recognize, which is mostly cats, dogs, horses, cars, et cetera, and make it recognize generic objects of the ones that I cared about. I didn't have to retrain the whole network. I didn't have to give it thousands or millions of images. I started from an already trained network and applied transfer learning. That is a very effective system if you don't have a lot of data. Uh, and then finally, um, whenever you're running experiments, you get results back and you're like, well, that's a little bit confusing, and then you design a new experiment. Reinforcement learning is exactly that. It's basically exploring an enormous space, making intelligent decisions about what step to make next, and then when you get results, updating the policy of how you make your decisions. Um, and then also drug discovery is increasingly automated. I'll be honest, I'm a robot fanatic. You know, when I was in grad school, they made me actually pipette and clone genes. I don't ever want to clone a gene again. If we do our job right at Incitro, all of the experiments we, will do, we do will be described as computer programs that are then executed on robots. Um, you know, when you have these kinds of problems, um, you know, when you're automating things, things become possible. For example, building a combinatorial chemical library. You can have um, a reaction machine that just produces all of these different molecules. You put each one on the shelf, and now it's ready for screening. Um, 
what we're realizing now, if you want to study biology of disease, you need to have lots of different cell types that represent your diseases and then have the ability to perturb them. Um, and then when you make those perturbations, you want to see what is the result of doing that, and how does that affect the disease, and then can we pop a ligand in there that will then um, kind of remediate the problem. Uh, you often have uh, very high product spaces, so I keep saying it's a large state space exploration. If you've got this combinatorial library and a large number of cell types, the cross product of those is an enormous space that you need to sample. How do you do that effectively using high throughput screening without visiting every single example? Um, and then finally, you want to use all that information that gives you models that explain why do drugs work the way they do. Uh, there's a lot of new tech. I'm not going to go um, into this too deeply, but CRISPR is the one, we've heard this mentioned before, that really makes it a lot easier to do genetic transformation. Um, genome sequencing is now an incredibly high throughput um, storage problem. You know, like a lot of people are complaining, this is actually going faster than, you know, um, than we can afford. Um, microscopes have completely changed. You know, if you thought of a microscope in the old days, like it was this tiny little thing you had to squint into, a microscope is now a really awesome looking device that glows. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that we build at in Citro. Um, it's, 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 it's a toolkit for building microscopes. Uh, and then finally, once you have all of those devices, you actually have to tie them together. So people are now building robot arms that can carry a plate from one device, say an incubator, to the microscope, back to the incubator to live for a while, grow some more, and then back to the microscope. And um, integrating all these is really challenging. So once you have all these things, what you're doing is you're basically building an industrial data factory. Instead of making widgets, you're making data. And you need that kind of data to train models. Um, you, you need um, uh, this uh, system to be coupled by the robot arms I was showing because technicians are expensive and if you can replace them with uh, robots that run 24-7, you can save a lot of money and get much higher throughput. Um, if you have multiple scientists who all want to run their experiments, you want to schedule it and multiplex it so there's a hard scheduling problem. Uh, very similar actually to internet data, um, internet data center. So Amazon has a data center, Google has a data center in Oregon. I actually think it makes sense that the robot facility should be housed as close as possible to that for uh, speed of light latency reasons. Um, and then this all, oh, sorry, this is actually what I really wanted to show you. This is our first data from in Citro. This is an example of cell painting. Every pixel in this image is labeled with a unique color that represents what the underlying physical component that generated it is. So you see the red around the edges, that's actin. The other colors all represent things. Literally, we are producing labeled data biologically that can then go straight into training algorithms. So that's actually a real accomplishment. Um, and then finally, you know, this is not going to be surprising anyone, but biology has been very artisanal. The experiments have been really hard to automate. Um, there's, you know, problems with combinatorial expansion and, and cursive dimensionality, noise, et cetera, batch effects. Turning all of this into actual knowledge is still a hard problem. I don't have any magic solutions for you, but the answer is, you know, we're going to apply some of the best machine learning algorithms and generate enormous amounts of data, and I feel pretty confident that this is actually going to transform how people do drug discovery. So thank you very much, and questions. So um, I haven't used the FPGAs in the Amazon Cloud. Um, I have used TPUs. TPUs are still fairly challenging to use outside of a very limited um, realm. So if you're doing convolutional neural networks, TPUs are a major win. If you, if you can find a network or you have an, an employee who knows how to write that system, absolutely. Otherwise, actually, I'm a big fan of distributed GPU training. Uh, very recently, there was a, um, a Baidu and um, Uber and Google have all released um, collective all reduce based training that use MPI style parallelism to speed up training. That's going to replace all of the old style approaches, and that's, that's um, different from how TPUs do it. Yeah. So I love the idea of an automated laboratory space, but there were a couple points when I tried to work these were third party providers, frankly. But when I tried to work with them, I found that the amount of time it would take to customize what was eighty percent there to actually be hundred percent there. By the time you reach that, there have been evolutions in technologies and therefore things need to change. So what's your strategy to focus on something which is basically the data factory concept? What are the areas that you focus on to reliably get that engine and more running without the risk of 
So basically, you're constantly leapfrogging. If you've ever looked at Intel, they have a TikTok where basically they're trying to do a major process advancement, and then the previous process advancement, um, which is now mature and well understood, is actually turned into a, a very uh, more optimized version of it, and they're continuously doing this. And so it's hard, but basically you always have to be pl planning for the future while executing on the past. No easy answers there. Okay, thank you.